But what I want to really talk to people about is IoT and the unsexy area of IoT. IoT is a huge buzzword, and, and people like to focus in on buzzwords because effectively, as human beings, we are neophiles. We like to focus on the new things. And IoT looks new. The other day, I don't know if you've seen it, you can get little Amazon Dash buttons. They released the one that I put in the basket, the one that I've always wanted, that I put on pre-order. It's a Play-Doh button. And I threatened to buy it and connect it to my wife's Amazon account so that my three-year-old son can just press the Play-Doh button whenever he wants. And it's his birthday today, so later on, he may be getting a button, a button of joy. When he presses it, Play-Doh gets ordered. It'll make him very happy. So let's talk about IoT. Um, when we talk about Internet of Things, and you ask people what's an example of IoT, they'll probably talk about Amazon Echoes and Google Ones. They'll talk about probably smart fridges. We've had smart fridges for a long, long time. They'll talk about smart heating, even adverts for IoT on TV with the, uh, um, what's it called, um, British Gas one. I have Nest, I have the other one. Hive, that's the one. And the whole interconnectedness. And they're not talking about just heating. They're talking about how you can control your lights and you can make your heating come on on the way home. And they're talking about all the positive benefits. You've even got smart cars. And you probably know about smart cars, or the internet of things attached to cars, basically because some researchers managed to hack various models of PHEV, Jeeps, and various other things, Chryslers and stuff like that, and what some of them even made them almost drive off the road, if you believe the pictures. Probably are true. So people focus in on these things here, and then some of the more edge products, and this is all new. If you'd gone back 10, 15 years, we didn't have smart fridges. If you'd gone back a while, we didn't have smart cars. Amazon Echoes, really are only, or that, uh, the smart personal digital assistants, are only really from like the last couple of years. And smart heating and all the smart sort of home systems is really only from like the last five or six years. So this all feels really new. Um, but the problem is, is that IoT isn't new. It's been in the office and it's been in your data centers for years. And it's really, really easy, really easy to forget this. And so if you start thinking about what is Internet of Things, what is the Internet of uh, Things in the office? Well, when I came on stage just then, there was a bit of fertling around in this area here, changing laptops and trying to find out what the right connector was, because that connector's different to the one that was on Graham's laptop, and, and often trying to work out which side the connector is on. Well, now you don't have to do that, because pretty much everyone now does um, IoT projectors. So the projector's connected by Wi-Fi. A bit of an aside, by the way, and I'm going to give you a marketing idea that I had the other day, which I'm never going to do, so I don't really mind. One of the little things I noticed is whenever someone plugs a, uh, a laptop into the projector, they're always searching either side for wherever it is because it could be random on either side. The car industry fixed this ages ago. If you look forward in your car and you look at the fuel gauge on your car, there'll be a little arrow that'll indicate which side the fuel cap is on. It'll either be an arrow or it'll be which way round the fuel pump is. It's on every car. And you tell this to people and they go, Really? And then they look in their own car and go, I've never seen that. I'd love to see a little logo at the top of laptops that go, the Ethernet port's that side, the, uh, um, the display port or whatever it is on that side. I'd love to see that. You can make millions of that. If you do make millions, please give me a few of the stickers for my own laptops. CCTV, hugely important. We're in an age now where we've swapped from traditional CCTV to IP CCTV. And this has two issues. Anyone remember last year there was a bit of a botnet issue called Mirai? Took down uh, half the internet. Unfortunately, it took down the bit of the half of the internet with all the SaaS services that most people depended upon. So actually, it took down the other half of the internet, practically speaking. And why was this allowed to occur? I'll tell you exactly why it's allowed to occur. As a mate of mine, a really good friend of mine who's an electrician, really great guy. And he's not an electrical engineer. No, he's an honest to God electrician. He goes up ladders and drills holes and does stuff and does rewires and puts consumer units in. And he also installs CCTV. And in the last two years, he's now been installing um, smart CCTV and Internet of Things CCTV. Now, when he went through school, they, they did cover, and when he went to his apprenticeship, they covered that the brown wire was the live wire, the blue wire was the neutral, and the yellow-colored one was the, uh, the uh, earth. By the way, I'm not an electrician, so if I did that wrong way round, please don't blame me for any electrocutions that might occur. I think that's the right way around. Anyways, he's installing these new things. And he contacted me the other day and said, Q, I need your help on something. He goes, what the heck is a default gateway? I went, ah, 
do you want to pop round for a beer and we'll sit here and do a networking 101 primer? And so you've got people like him, who's a really great guy, who's installing a lot of the CCTV systems that go into the small and Soho areas. And it is not his fault. He doesn't understand the security measures. My plumber helped me install a brand new heating system about two or three years ago. And I installed um, Nest on top of it. Other smart heating systems are available. And um, he contacted me recently and said, Q, you installed Nest, didn't you? And yeah, it's really, really cool. He goes, can I, um, I'll, when I come round to do your regular service in Feb, can I just pop and have a little bit of a look around and take some photographs and just see how you put it together on the system? I said, uh, Bill, why? Why was that? He goes, well, it's kind of where the whole world's going, and I just want to see how it all goes together before I do my first install. So you've got people like him, who's a great guy. He can do... Um, Huge amounts of in installs. He can calculate how many BTUs and where you'd place the radiators for optimal performance in this room. But again, he doesn't know anything about networking. And now he's having to learn wireless connectivity. He's having to learn about Zigbee. He's having to learn about all of this stuff that he never, ever got taught when he was actually going, because he went through a proper college to be a heating engineer. Um, and so these kind of equipment is being installed by these people. Do we blame them? Well, maybe not, really. And you've got these CCTV systems, which now... You think of HD, well, actual fact, 4K is the new one. Even HK, 8K is coming. So you've got these boxes that are transmitting huge amounts of data. I mean, really, really significant amounts of data. I've got two Nest cams, and they blow through 100 gigabytes of data per month each. Yeah, my overage charge on my DSL in, uh, in December, when I installed both of them simultaneously, was uh, over 200 quid, which I unfortunately had to pay for, because generally I had used it. So this stuff is sitting there. And when you've got large amounts of bandwidth and unsecured devices, there is only one outcome that's going to occur. It's the same, amount, same conversation when you've got large amounts of money and insecured systems. What does that equal? Criminality. What does large amounts of bandwidth and insecure systems equal? DDoS and criminality. So this is just stuff that's lurking in your office. Video conferencing systems. If you think back to Graham's slides earlier on, he showed you that little list of all of the shadow brokers' exploits that they had up for sale. Now, if you clicked through the manufacturer's little thing and had a look in there, where all the devices were arranged by manufacturer, you would have spotted a shed load of video conferencing systems in the shadow brokers' data dump. Now, they haven't released those yet, and I'm waiting to see when they do release them, because when Graham was talking about unpatched systems, well, who here's patched one of their VC systems recently? I'm not seeing any nodding. And where do they typically sit? They sit in boardrooms, senior management meeting rooms. And by definition, they have a big camera sitting on top, nice high-definition camera. They have a microphone built in. And they're connected generally to the internet because, well, you want to VC out to other offices. So what have you got? You've got this thing that is a listening device by its very nature. It um, has a camera. People present really interesting things on it. People talk about very interesting things in front of it. And lo, the NSA realized, my god. That's a really good place if we want to get into corporates. And so, have a look at that list from Shadow Brokers. There's a shed load of Shadow Brokers exploits. And even, even printers, even printers, that unloved thing in the corner of the room that I guarantee you, you all have. You may not have Wi-Fi projectors yet. You may not have the really funky video conferencing systems. You probably will have the IP CCTV because you pretty much can't do anything else apart from install that because it's much more convenient and much more useful. Um, but I guarantee you, you'll have these things. Remember we talking about IoT not being new. Well, this stuff's been in the office, connected to the network, connected to the internet for years. And people forget about it because it's the unsexy end of IT. And so... Why is this the, the point? Well, people forget about the threats. They see, it, they see it in the corner. It's always been there. Boring beige box. They're not boring beige boxes anymore, but they're sitting there. It's obviously not sexy. Print vendors do not go after the CIO, typically, because they're traditionally used to going after the head of facilities, because print is all under facilities. And what do facilities care about? Do they care about IT or IT security? Straw poll here. Yeah, no, facilities care about how fast it is, um, how cheap it is to run. They're the metrics that they do. They don't care about the extra IT bits. I mean, reality, you've got this familiarity breed contempt, and a lot of IT people turn around and say, we're not even paying for that, and it's someone else's money. 
So this then comes on to a question of our printers, and actually more importantly, is that business IoT, is that really IT's problem? Is it? Is it IoT's problem? Sorry, is it IoT's problem? Is it IT's problem? Well, let's look at what a modern printer can do. It can scan to email, file share, scan to cloud. By the way, this is not a particular sales pitch. This is just for the printing industry. All of them do these things. They can share email files. They can integrate with Active Directory, which means that every printer is connected in some way into your AD network and any other authentication network you're using. It's interesting. Oh, and by the way, they, they actually also can print, I'm being told as well. Along with all of this stuff here, with many, many more things being added every single year, they can also print. And what do you tend to print? Do you print out your junk mail? Do you print out documents that are unimportant? That No, no, you tend to print out the ones you actually do need to print out. So the important things. And I, I came to a, um, I had a, a conference and I was chatting to someone and they said, ah, but Quentin, that's not my problem. I'm the CISO. I only handle electronic breaches. Physical breaches are someone else's problem. And I turned to him and I said, C-I-S-O. What does the I stand for in your job title? I don't stand for in my job title. I went, information. I went, it doesn't stand for electronic information. You're not the C-E-I-S-O, are you? No. So you're the CISO and you're telling me that if it goes into paper format, that becomes physical security's problem. It's like you get CIOs who turn around and say, oh, I'm not responsible for that because that's something else. Like, no, no, you're the chief information officer, not the head of IT. Um, you're not the lead techie. If you're a CIO, you're a chief information officer. So, of course, this is your responsibility if you're a chief information security officer. And despite my very, very good looks, I'm a little older than I appear to be. I remember when we still had under-desk servers. I remember when we had servers that did critical things. I remember 2003 where we had, what was the one that, what was the big malware that's spreading in 2003? Someone shouted out. So big. No, 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 not so big. I want the one that went peer to peer. Was it Blaster? Blaster. Yeah, Blaster. I remember suddenly disconnecting a load of client <laughs> networks in 2003 and discovering trucks piling up up the road. And I just said, what are the trucks piling up the road for? Oh, well, we've just lost access to the, uh, to the, the, the print server that prints the um, shipping notes. So the print, these trucks can't unload because we can't check them in and they can't leave with anything because we can't sort of check them out. And I'm standing there going, hang on a second, I just disconnected a desktop VLAN over there. And yes, the printer that did everything for the whole warehouse operations was under there. And that was, we went through this whole revolution and lots of companies at the time and removed all of the under desk servers because it's a pile of rubbish when you have stuff under the desk. Oh, sorry, sorry, getting ahead of myself there. And really and truly, all a printer is, if you remember all of those things I talked to you about, if you don't watch it, a printer is just a server that isn't in the server room. It's a visible server that's sitting right there that has shed loads of really important data accumulating gently on it until someone decides to walk in and say, hi, I'm from IT, I'd like your hard drives, or hey, we're moving that printer somewhere else, and you forget about the data you've lost. And in January 2017, there was another big threat that came out. Everyone here knows what PostScript is. I see nodding, and that's interesting. Do you really know what PostScript is, or you just know it's a format that documents come in? PostScript actually is a, pr is a, a printer, printer, um, printer language, and it's PCL, printer control language. Um, and you can do real programming inside it. I mean, like, you can do for loops, you can conditional stuff, you can do ifs, then, that. You can do all of this in PostScript. Most people just use it to format print jobs, but you can do some really interesting things in it. And because it's old and it's kind of like the unloved elephant that sits in the room again, people just com kind of completely ignore it. And a very interesting group of um, university researchers revealed um, that in 2017 that with PostScript print jobs, you could take over some people's printers. That because of the fact you can reach the printer, you can send a PostScript job, which is literally a whole load of scripting, a whole load of text, and the scripting tells the uh, printer how to in pardon me, interpret that text. But you can do more. And they worked out on some manufacturer's printers how to get the printer to overwrite its own NVRAM chips and therefore actually kill the printer stone dead because you'd have to unsolder the chip off the board and then put a new one in and be cheaper to replace the printer. They showed how easy it would be to uh, cause the printer to dump its entire config and all its username and passwords that were cached back. Remember I told you that they're mainly connected to active, well, they'll be connected into AD for authentication. I'll come on to it later on. So if I, via the printer, via a print job, can walk into your office, say, Oh, be a darling, just print that for me. 
Or I'll email a document in and say, you just print that document and send me a copy back. I don't care about the copy you're going to send back. What I care about is the document that you've just sent to the printer. The printer has then executed the print job, executed my postscript job, and suddenly I'm now receiving passwords back out of your, out of your network. What's not to love? There's a lot more information, by the way, and jump down to that URL at the bottom. So, I'm talking about a lot of negatives because it's really easy to focus in on negatives. It's really easy to have you walking out of this room scared. I don't believe in fear cells. I think fear cells are late, well, I think they are a short-term cell. I think you've got to start focusing in on the positives. And if you've got an issue where there's a huge problem, and then you can mitigate that problem, and only mitigate the problem, improve your security stance, what's not to love about that? So let's just run through some case studies. And of course, these case studies, and I'm going to talk to them in a lot of detail, but these can apply to the whole industry, the whole print industry, but people don't know about these kind of functionalities. So guest print. Who here has a large corporate and you have a large number of people wandering in every day and they typically want to print boarding passes, meeting minutes, they've flown in long haul and they want 10 copies of that and they certainly didn't want to fly with 10 copies of whatever the hell the, uh, the report was in their, in their bag. It's a really, really common story. Or you have an awful lot of um, consultants who come in and out every single day and somehow they need to be able to print. And you end up setting up these like fake Active Directory accounts not really connected to a real Big Four auditor just so that they can print. And then one of your, um, your, your SOX auditors or one of your corporate auditors comes in and says, what the hell are all these accounts? What are they being used for? Well, we had a big corporate up in uh, the Nordics, they had huge numbers of people coming in every single week to run conferences and do this stuff. And they used to have two members of staff sitting there to manage a printer and manage guest relations. With guest print, you don't need that. You can actually set it up to say, email the print job to this email address, follow the on-screen instructions, go to a printer, you can see any printer, type the code in, boom, your job comes out. You remove the AD accounts, you remove the users sitting there, it's all great. There was, um, who has, um, who's, has deployed DLP, data loss prevention technology? It's expensive stuff, costs a lot of money, you want to leverage it. We were talking to a large financial institution, and what one of their ent uh, enterprising employees had realized is they had their machines completely locked down. You couldn't print anything sensitive, you couldn't do anything. It really, really was completely locked down. But what someone realized was if they picked up a piece of paper which was sensitive, walked over to a printer, photocopied it, that bypassed the DLP, they could then print a lot of this stuff and walk out with the bank's information. Very, very, very easy to do. Would it not be great if you could actually log every print job, every scan job, every fax job, everything else? And lo, you can. So you take a risk, which is people walking off your premises with your data, and you make it, link it into this very, very expensive DLP solution you probably spent an entire year or two implementing and make everything better. It was a large dot com, actually this is a personal one, so you can probably work out which dot com this was if you look at my LinkedIn profile and go backwards. And the HR director left a big A3 page of every single person's remuneration and benefits for the year up to December, probably come back from a party, left it in the, the output tray, ran off and left it there. Three days later he came to the printer to pick a print job up, went, oh what's that? Why is this paper so badly thumbed? Wow, that's not been printed today. Oh God, that's the entirety of everyone's performance reviews, salaries, and data. Because they left data on the output tray. Well, would it not be better if you can have it so that when the person walks up to the printer and logs on with palm print, iris scan, AD, or even just their access badge, just bleeps their access badge, only the print jobs that they've sent come out. And then think about this. You move people around the building an awful lot. The first thing they ask for when they move around the building is they go, oh, I, I, IT service desk, can you set up that printer there as my default printer? You enable this, you don't do default printers anymore. Again, this really is the basics. But think about how many service desk calls you have in your organization where people are asking for, can you change my default printer? And the last one is about people who put printers on the <coughs> internet. Now, Graham earlier on was talking about how did the WannaCry malware get into those networks? Now, I, don't, I have a suspicion as to how it got in. I don't think it came in via email. I'm absolutely, almost certainly didn't come via email. IBM did some scanning recently and searched through, I think it was like a billion and a half emails that were in spam filters, and they said, we've not seen a single thing of WannaCry in there. So it didn't come in probably via email. Was it walked in via USB stick, sort of like um, 
um, um, like the, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, centrifuge um, place? Was it walked in? I doubt it. It's too widespread. I don't think it could have come in that way. What I suspect happened is someone scanned through Shodan or did like a mass scan, the did a scan through and SMB found machines open. connected to the internet with their SMB ports open. When we did a scan for printers connected to the internet, and this was last Thursday, there were over 180,000 printers that were connected to the internet. Now, I am sure that a small percentage of those printers connected to the internet were there by design. And if you were to speak to the security people in that company, they'd say, ah, yes, it's connected. We've signed off on the risk. We know why it's there. But for the other 179,980 of those printers connected to the internet, I suspect they were just put there because that was the default position, and they didn't know. And what can happen if that goes really badly wrong? So an enterprising researcher, that's his email address there, nice guy, actually, Lemo Stack, on Twitter, you can follow him, sent a print job, this print job, to, at the time, there were 150,000 printers connected to the internet. See, just when he did it earlier on the year's 150, we checked the other day, we saw 180. Uh, although I don't know how he scanned. But anyway, so he sent this print job saying, hey, your printer's been compromised. No, it hasn't. Please disconnect it from the internet if you don't want to receive more rubbish like this. There's an enterprising hacker called Weave, Andrew Arnheimer, who sent some really quite nasty stuff to printers a long time ago to tell people, you probably shouldn't be doing this. Now, I didn't like his methods, but I did like his message. His message was, don't connect printers to the internet unless you need to be there, unless you want random stuff coming out. But this is just about random stuff coming out of the printers. Remember I told you about the postscript issue, where in some printers you can actually execute arbitrary command via the postscript job? Well, any of these printers that were connected to the internet, if they had the postscript engine inside, because not all printers have true postscript engines inside, well, you could have run that attack on them. So you could send nasty information. You could send junk mail. Remember junk faxes? Junk faxes from years ago? I'm surprised no one does junk printing, to be honest. I'm surprised we haven't seen that. There's 180,000 customers connected to the internet who have got their printers there. You could send spam out. Please, by the way, if people start doing that, don't say Quentin Taylor said at, Fort Su at um, Forces Conference that you could do this. Don't say that. But how do you deal with this? If you don't expect them to on the internet, get them off the internet. It's not the sexy stuff. It's not buying an APT solution. It's not buying some really, really expensive sandboxing solution from, from a certain American company that has fire at the beginning of their title. What it's about is looking at your perimeter and saying, should that be there? So let's just jump through a bit faster. So what I'm actually asking is a bit of a call for help. And I'm reaching out to all of you, all of you here. If you recognize the risk, you should take action. And it's not just printers, it's your CCTV, it's all of your office IoT. If you recognize that risk in your office IoT, as I mentioned earlier on, take some action. It doesn't cost you money, it costs you only time. You don't need to go to your CIO or whoever signs off on your budget and say, I need half a million for this uber duber sexy fancy box. You just need some time to be able to look at the network, look at the data and say, that's not how it should be. And how do you assess IoT devices? It's really, really simple. There's a bit of a longer chain that goes off. Look at the running services. Who here runs a scan through their network for stuff they don't know about? Exactly. We all say we do, but do we actually do it? The last time I did it in one of our Amsterdam offices, I found the entirety of one of the uh, conference rooms with all of its kit exposed onto the internal network, because that's where Facility installed it, um, and remotely, you could turn the microphones on and off, you could um, flip screens, you could make the screen go up and down. Oh, we had such fun for 10 minutes before we went, we probably should get this fixed. Look at what's running and look at the security model. Ask the vendor, what is the security model that this is adhering to? And if they go goldfish-like, well, maybe you want to pick a different vendor. There's a lot of text, so I'm not going to go through all of this. But assess the security of the device. Don't just read the documents. Actually, put it in your test network and have a look at it. You wouldn't consider installing a server, installing a major mission-critical app without actually running a small assessment on it, would you? No, you wouldn't. But yet people just say, oh, hang on a second, there's brand new security cameras up there in our office. I wonder what network they're on. Well, find out. Otherwise, you'll be the next one in the mirror issue. Assume that they're leaking information. The numbers of times that we've got these huge deployments of IoT devices, and then someone turns around and goes, oh, hang on a second, that internet-connected doorbell is talking back to China. And you go, how many of them did they were sold? Millions of the damn things were sold, 
And it took a, and then a researcher trying to track down a problem on his network, on his home network, to go, why is my internet connected doorbell talking back to China? No one had done it. Don't assume someone else will have looked. That many eyes principle pretty much means that the responsibility between each set of eyes is tiny. And suddenly, everyone assumes that someone else has looked. And the true picture is, no one looked. So assume the, the device could be hostile. The manufacturer is no, degree, no guarantee of quality. A long time ago, I was dealing with an internet uh, connected, um, or internal network connected, remote door locking system for a really major door manufacturer, or lock manufacturer, that you would recognize instantaneously if I told you who they were. If you port scanned them, there obviously was some kind of issue inside, the, uh, the box, the door lock would reboot. And when it rebooted, it would actually open, because that was the fail safe, because it's a door lock, so when it goes into uh, error state, it, it unlocks. So we'd have a joke at the time that when you wanted to enter the data center, you just phone back and go, yeah, can you port scan the um, DC3's door lock again, please? Click, thank you. And they go, oh, it's really strange. Can we go offline for a little while? We had a system with um, a certain major network manufacturers, um, uh, call managers. You know, the thing that connects all the IP phones together? If you port scan the decane, it fell over. Uh, Muggins here was actually port scanning this quite happily one morning. Look, every time I port scan this, my phone goes blank. And then I found out that, yes, it went blank for everyone in Europe. <clears throat> yeah. And that's because I'd assumed that we tested it before, and we hadn't. I learned from every one of these, by the way. I am the example that your mother warned you about. So learn from my mistakes and don't make these mistakes again. That device discovery in your network. Facilities never asked me for permission before. They chucked in a whole AV and conferencing system and just dumped it on the internal network. They plugged it into an RJ45 port, and it worked. What's not to love? It all was all fine. And then we said, no, 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 you need to get that off the network because otherwise we're going to, well, people will play with it. We don't know what the impact is. Um, and the last one down here is, which of these devices contain business or mission critical data? If it was stolen, would that cause you a problem? If someone walked in and stole your multifunctional printer device, could you even consider telling the ICO what could have been on there? Do you even know what could have been on there? So wrapping up now. We often forget those positives. We forget the fact that it's very easy to focus on that glass that's half full and forget that by fixing the problems, you can turn it into a glass that is full. You can turn these risks on their head and actually make them into things that can improve your security posture. And tiny, tiny, tiny differences. Just checking through the manufacturer's documentation. Just TCP dumping, the traffic coming backwards and forwards on a device, and actually looking at it in some, in some kind of analysis tool like Wireshark or whatever else, and looking going, what's it doing that for? Oh, hang on a second, it's not even encrypted. Or discovering that it's not even checking the validity of the SSL certificate so you can impersonate it. Um, these are really, really basic things, and they're the unsexy basics. But as Mirai showed us, they're the unsexy basics that can take out half of the internet. I want to finalize on one point here. You... All of you have control. Unless you ask a manufacturer to put the security features in, they're not going to do it. You have the ability, both at home and at work, to vote with your feet. I was at a conference a little while ago, and someone said to me, but manufacturers should put this in. And I said, yeah, they will do. Has anybody here walked away from a sale because security was not being considered in the product? If you don't, then you need to think, am I part of that problem? We buy cars because they're more safe for our family, for our people. And yet, why do we continue to buy products that are inherently insecure and then blame the manufacturers when we had the opportunity to say, manufacturer, I'm not going to buy that because it's not secure. Bake security in, and I'll be back. Thank you, everyone. I'm on Twitter at Quentin Blog. I'm emailed here. This presentation we sent around to all of you. And... Uh, I'll be around in the break, so if you want to see me, come up and ask some questions. And I think I'm just about on time. Thank you, everybody.